we've been in a series uh, called the Apostles' Creed, and uh, as I've been thinking about this, um, you know, it's interesting. We live in a in a day and age in a culture right now where we talk a lot about what is essential, right? Has anybody ever has anybody heard that in the last four months? Right? So like essential, non-essential. Like we talk a lot about what that is. What, what businesses are essential, which ones are not. Um, l- last night as I was, I was working on uh, this message, I, I uh, jumped online because I wanted to listen to the song that we just sang. Right? This I Believe. And, uh, and I'm like, I want to listen to this song just to kind of let it, let it, you know, like flow over me and, and soak into my mind, let it marinate a little bit. And as soon as I hit play on YouTube, this little pop-up came up and it said, laundromats are now essential. And I was like, what? And, uh, and, and in my head, I'm thinking, you know, my, my grandparents had an essential laundry, right? And you know how they did it? They washed it by hand. You know what I mean? And so, like, you start to think about, like, well, really, what's essential and what's not essential? And uh, and so I'm thinking through this uh, this past week and thinking about the Apostles' Creed. And and here's what we realize. The Apostles' Creed uh, is a summary of the essentials of the Christian faith. I had somebody come up to me last week, and they're like, "Where, where do I find that in the Bible? Well, it's not in the Bible. The Apostles' Creed isn't in the Bible. It's not in, I can't give you a chapter and a verse. But what it is, is it's a summary of the essentials of the Christian faith. So if you're a follower of Jesus, these are the essential things that you need to know and understand and believe. Like these, this is it. And um, Al Mohler is a pastor and author. Uh, He wrote a book on the Apostles' Creed. And this is what he said. He said, the creed helps us to say everything we have to say in order to say enough to communicate the gospel. Did you get that? The the Apostles' Creed, the creed helps us to say everything we have to say in order to say enough to communicate the gospel. So the Apostles' Creed, this is the essentials of the gospel. So these are things as followers of Jesus Christ, as church folk, we have to believe, We, we, we need to believe, okay? Um, And so essential means what? It means absolutely necessary. So these are the things that we, these are non-negotiable. And so Colossians chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at uh, this this third part to our series called the Apostles' Creed. And so as you're turning there, I want to read the Apostles' Creed, um, and we've done this the last couple of weeks, and maybe some of you are, how many of you grew up in a church tradition where this was, this was normal? This was like, you did this all the time, right? So, Jerry, you can come on up here and actually recite it. No, okay. So, so here's, I want to, I'm going to read it for you, okay? So as you're turning to Colossians 1, let's look at the Creed uh, and what it says, what we believe, maybe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead." I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. We'll talk about that and unpack that. Don't get crazy. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. That right there, that creed, is is the essentials of the gospel. Now listen to me. That's old. That's an old document. You realize that, right? We didn't just come up with that like a couple years ago. Like, this has been around for thousand years, right? Like, like we have uh, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ who have gone before us have declared these essentials. And, and you know why? To keep them from veering off track. We need this again, don't we? And it's so easy for us as the church 
as the church to, to veer off of what the truth of the gospel is, to veer off of um, what God has called us to believe and know and understand. That's why it's so important for us to come back to something like this, to say, you know what, he, we, we need a summary of what it is um, to be a follower of Jesus. What do we believe? What do we follow? What do we understand? And so this, um, this part of the Apostles' Creed that we're going to look at this morning is, is this picture of Jesus, that He is uh, the Son of God, our Lord. And, and we want to unpack that this morning. And, and so Colossians chapter 1, uh, many scholars actually believe that this passage, uh, verses 15 through 18 that we're going to look at, um, that they believe that this passage was actually used as a hymn. Uh, and it was sung when the, when the church gathered together, that they gathered together and they recited these verses because it was so central to what they believed. It was so key to, to their understanding of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And, and so they would actually sing this as they would gather together. It's one of the most profound descriptions of the person and work of Jesus in all of Scripture. It's the very heart of Christianity. It's the very heart of all reality. Jesus is the I am of eternity. And so everything, everything, and that includes everything, you got to interact, okay? Everything is defined, determined, and measured by Jesus. We need to remember that. Everything, Everything in life, everything that you do, everything that you experience is defined, determined, and measured by who? It's by Jesus. And so I want to do this morning is I want to look at two aspects of Jesus that are essential for us to understand based on Colossians chapter 1. Two aspects of Jesus that are essential. Um, and so Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15... Starting in verse 15, it says this, He, capital H, He is the image of the invisible God. Stop. Circle the word image in your Bible. Okay? Image actually conveys meaning, right? So this word icon is, is actually the word that's used here. Uh, it, it conveys meaning way beyond what words can describe. Right? So, so think of an image that conveys meaning. I mean, there's so many things, right? The golden arches. <laughs> what does that convey? Heart attack. French fries. Okay, yes. Okay, we'll go with that. Right? And so all these images, right? All these images convey something. The Statue of Liberty. I mean, think about that, right? When, when we picture the Statue of Liberty, what do we think of? Freedom. Does the Statue of Liberty give us freedom? No. It represents a country that honors freedom, right? And so it's, a, it's an image, it's a picture, it's an icon. And, and that's what this passage is saying. He, capital H, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is essential to our understanding of who God is. Did you hear that? Jesus is essential to our understanding of who God is. It, it's been said that... Um, after the giving of Jesus, okay, after the giving of Jesus, God had nothing left to say. Hebrews chapter 1, let me read this. Hebrews chapter 1. We read these words. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the, does anybody know? By the prophets. So, so, the author of Hebrews is saying, listen, God used to speak to people through prophets. And, and listen to what it says. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance, listen to this, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So when God God the Father gives Jesus, right? When Jesus incarnate comes to the earth, God has nothing more to say. Jesus is God with skin on. 
And this is the picture that we get in Colossians chapter 1. If you want to know who God is, if you want to know what God is like, if you want to know what His tone is, what His demeanor is, what, how He behaves, how He feels, how He responds, all you need to do is look at Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. It's why this part of the Apostles' Creed is so important, right? So, uh, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, what does it say? His Son. His Son. The first aspect of Jesus that is essential. Write this down. Jesus' Sonship is essential. Jesus' sonship is, is essential. Why is it important that Jesus is the Son of God? What does that even mean? Look at verse 15 again. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. It does not mean that Jesus was created. That, that word firstborn actually means uh, um, priority, right? Or a place of honor, that he goes before all things. And, and we know that it doesn't mean that he was created because, look at verse 16. The firstborn of all creation, verse 16. For by him, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him. Jesus creates everything. He is before all of creation. And, and so what does this mean, that, that Jesus is the Son of God? When we say, I believe in Jesus Christ, His Son, what does that mean? It means that, that Jesus is God, that He is divine. Verse 19, verse 19 says this, Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, For in Him all the fullness of God, for in Jesus, what does it say? All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In Jesus, everything that Jesus did on earth is another piece to the puzzle of God. Again, right? We want to understand. If you want to know what God is like, if you want to see what God, how God behaves or how he responds or how he reacts, look at Jesus. Everything that Jesus did on earth is another piece of the puzzle of saying, okay, this is, this is what I understand about God. And so think about all the things that Jesus did here on earth. Think about the different encounters that he had. From the manger of Bethlehem to the baptismal waters of the Jordan to the stormy sea of Galilee to the cross of Golgotha and ultimately the empty tomb. We look at all the things that Jesus has done. It gives us a picture of who God is. God left the throne of heaven. He wrapped himself in human flesh to take on our sin. Jesus is God. Jesus being the Son of God means that He is the one true God. He's not a, he, he's not a sidekick. <laughs> he's not an assistant. Jesus doesn't show up on the scene and say, hey, I, I, I know God. He doesn't, he doesn't say, hey, um, I, I've met God. He shows up on the scene and He says what? I am God. He's Emmanuel, God with us. Listen, this is essential for us to believe and understand as followers of Jesus. He represents God. He radiates God. He reveals God. John chapter 14, verse 9. John 14, 9, Jesus says this, You want to see the Father? You want to see the Father? You're looking at Him. Listen to what He says. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. 1 John chapter 5, verse 5. I, I was reading uh, this verse this past week and I was like, man, this is powerful and challenging. 
1 John chapter 5, verse 5, it says this, Who is it that overcomes the world? So, so John poses a question. Who is it that overcomes the world? <coughs> Who is it that overcomes the world? We want to overcome, right? We want to overcome all the things that, that we have to deal with on this side of eternity. Who is it that overcomes the world? Look what it says. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? (laughs) The key to overcoming the world is believing that Jesus is the Son of God, that He Himself is God. So that understanding, you picking this up? Understanding that Jesus is God, that He is the Son of God, is essential to our faith. So he says, the Apostles' Creed says, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son. We got that part. Here's the second part. Here's the second aspect of, of, that's essential uh, about Jesus. Jesus' Lordship is essential. See, there's, there's part of us, right, that wants to say, yeah, I believe that Jesus is God. Yeah, I believe that, that he came, he died on the cross for my sins, and, and that because of that, because of him paying that price for my sin, that I get to go uh, to heaven, that I get to spend eternity with God. I believe that. But there's something, we miss something in this next part. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? This is the crowd participation part. What does it mean, Jesus is Lord? What's that? He's king over all. He's king over everything. He's master. He's boss. He's ruler. He's in the driver's seat, right? Jesus is Lord is is used over 250 times in the New Testament. Do you think it's important? Uh, Yeah. Jesus is Lord. This is essential to being a follower of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 16. Colossians chapter 1, the second part of uh, verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, okay? Because he's God. Because he's the son of God. But look at this. And for him. Everything was created by Jesus and, what does it say? You got to say it. Everything was created by him and you were created for Jesus. Verse 17. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything, that in what? Everything, he might be preeminent. That in everything, he might be preeminent. Here's what that means. That he would be superior to all things. That in everything, Jesus would be Lord that he would be master, ruler. So everything was created for him. He holds everything together. He's king over all. And our response to that should be, the answer is yes. Jesus, whatever you want me to do, whatever you're asking me to do, the answer is yes. Because you are Lord. You are my ultimate authority. It seems interesting that we would even have to clarify that in a church. And yet we're living in a culture where we have minimized Jesus and we've maximized ourselves. Right? We're living in a culture where we'll say, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, I believe that He died on the cross for my sins. Yes, I believe that He rose again from the from the tomb. But I don't know if I believe that he's Lord. Or or we'll say we believe that he's Lord and live like he's not. 
because we've minimized Jesus and we've maximized ourselves. We've moved away from, am I living in light of His Lordship? Am I, when we wake up every morning, are we saying, God, you're Lord today. You're the ruler today. You're calling the shots today. Am I living in light of His Lordship? Or am I living, what can Jesus do for me? Is that my mindset? We've added Jesus to our lives instead of adoring Him with our lives. We think He's important, but not essential. We've given Him a place in our lives without realizing that He demands all of it. We haven't denied Him. I mean, we're church folk, right? We haven't denied Him, but you know what we have done? We've dethroned Him. Jesus is sitting on a throne that Nate was talking about earlier. Jesus is sitting on a throne. You want to know why? Because it's his rightful place as ruler, as king. And we don't treat him like he's on his throne. And it's partially the church's fault. I mean, the, the church in general, it's partially our fault because instead of inviting people, instead of inviting people to a life of surrender, we've, we've instead invited people to like, hey, do you want to have a stress-free life? You should follow Jesus. Like, this is what we've done as a church. We've in, there's this easy believism that we've told people. Instead of calling them to a, a holy life, we've, we've, we've said, you know what? You know what you really need is you need a happy marriage. You need a happy life. God wants you to be happy. Find me chapter and verse for that one. God didn't call us to be happy. He called us to be holy. And when we pursue holiness, we get joy. And joy, I'm telling you right now, look at me. Joy is way better than happiness. Because joy goes beyond circumstances. Joy goes beyond uh, uh, an empty room. (laughs) You know how discouraging it is? Pastor Drew and I were talking about this this morning. So discouraging to see so many empty chairs. God has called us to a life of holiness. Even when circumstances are hard, we can still experience joy. And I hope and I pray that you're here this morning and you know that joy. But that joy only comes when he's on the throne. Psalm 91, I believe, says, The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. So we can have joy, we can rejoice because he's what? He's reigning. He's still on the throne. So we've added Jesus to our lives instead of adoring him with our lives. Jesus doesn't come on the scene and say, hey, be like me. He doesn't go to the disciples and say, hey, be like me. I want you to do what I do. I want you to just be like me. You familiar with your Bible? Jesus comes to the disciples and what does he call them to do? If anyone would come after me, let him be like me. Is that what it says? Who knows their Bible? If anyone would come after me, let him take up his cross. Lay down your life. You surrender. Why? Because he's Lord. The lordship of Jesus is essential as a follower of Jesus Christ. You cannot have salvation without submission. You cannot have salvation without surrender. I heard a preacher say one time, 
If Jesus isn't Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. How does that play out? Well, we would say things like, well, Jesus is Lord of my life, but, but there's this one area that I, I got this. He doesn't even need to worry about it. Like, I got this area. And we think that we can control all the different parts and pieces of our life. And Jesus is saying what? Surrender. Give it all to me. Philippians 2.10, 2.10 and 11, it says this, that at the name of Jesus, you know this one, that at the name of Jesus, what? Every knee shall bow. Why? Because he's our Savior? Partially true. Why are we going to bow? Who do you bow before? Who do you bow before? The King, the Lord. At some point, when the egg timer goes off and all this is done and Jesus comes back, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. As the worship team comes up, I want to look at an um, interesting passage this morning with you. In John chapter 20, we have this incredible picture of, of what we're talking about. And I'm, I'm always about word pictures, right? I'm always about like, let, show, me, show me how it works. Show me what it looks like in somebody's life. gathered together with the worship team before, um, before we came in here. And I looked around the room and I asked him a question. And I won't put him on the spot. But I asked him a question and I said, what parts of God do you struggle to believe? And you know what? There were some really honest answers. There were some really transparent answers. And, and I would assume that there's many of us sitting out here right now, many of us hearing this message right now, who would say, you know what, I can make a list. One of the people in the room said, how much time do we have? <laughs> because if we're honest, right, if we're honest with ourselves, there's things that we struggle to believe about God whether it's because of circumstances in your life or things that have happened to you or things that, things that you have done. But there's, there's parts of our life that we're like, I, I know that God is great, but I'm not sure He's good. John chapter 20. We read a story about a guy named Thomas. You know Thomas, don't you? There's a little bit of Thomas in us, isn't there? Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the disciples are all gathered together. Jesus shows up and they're just like, What? Like you're alive. This is real. This is happening. Just like you said. And Thomas isn't there. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. They spent three years together, right? Like they were, they were arm in arm for three years. They saw Jesus do incredible things miraculous things, supernatural things. They heard him teach with authority like nobody else has ever taught. And they spent three years shoulder to shoulder experiencing these things together. And, and the lot of them come to Thomas and they're like, guess what? We saw Jesus. Not just one of them. It wasn't just Peter that showed up and said, hey, we, we saw Jesus. They all show up. 
and they look at Thomas and they're like, we saw Jesus. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Wow. Thomas, you've got, you've got all these other people that you have walked through life with. Three years. Like, I'm, I'm assuming that you can trust these people. And they're all telling you, we've seen Jesus. And he says, I don't believe it. I will never believe it. Don't you love how Jesus meets us where we're at? Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, Peace be with you. He, he comes in, right? Doesn't use the door. That's pretty awesome. He comes into the room and he says, Peace be with you. And he turns his attention to Thomas. And he looks right at Thomas. And he says, you idiot. That's not what he says. He doesn't shame him. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand. He's like, give me your hand. Let me see your hand for a second. And he places it in his side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Doubting Thomas goes from the greatest unbelief, right? Like, can you imagine looking at Jesus and saying, or looking at people and saying, I will never believe unless I see it. So going from that level of unbelief, that level of doubt, to the greatest declaration that any of the disciples have ever made. So he gets a bad mark, right? Because we're like, oh, doubting Thomas. He didn't believe. He didn't have any faith, yada, yada. And he goes from that to the greatest declaration that you could ever make. The declaration that we find in the Apostles' Creed, the declaration that we see in Colossians chapter 1. That followers of Jesus have declared for centuries. And my prayer is this, this morning. This would be your declaration. It wouldn't just be lip service, but it would be something that you say, I believe this, I know this, and I'm going to live this. I want my theology to become my biography. I want to live out what I believe. And here's what Thomas says. Thomas answered him. Can't imagine what emotion came with these words. Thomas looks at Jesus and he says, My Lord and my God. I believe that you are the divine. I believe that you are the I am. I believe that you are the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. I believe that you are God. And I believe that you're Lord. That you are the master, the ruler, and the king of everything. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? And then he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. <laughs> that we don't get to stick our finger in his hand. We don't get to stick our hand in his side. But we believe. And we declare this morning, my Lord and my King. Amen? I want you to stand and we're going to sing this song again called This I Believe. And, and I, um, this song, okay, this song is a declaration of what is essential. 
essential to the gospel and essential to our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. So let's declare it. Let's sing it like it's essential, like we believe it. Let's do that together.